Even the littlest changes can stick out like a fire. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 differences between the Little Fires Everywhere book and miniseries. For this list, we'll be looking at the most significant changes made in Hulu's adaptation of Celeste Ng's 2017 novel. In case you haven't read or watched either, there will be some big spoilers. Number 10. Izzy's Rebellion She may be neglected at home, but if there's one character who's given a lot more attention in this adaptation, it's Izzy. What are you wearing? I'm gonna button it. While the tension between Elena and her youngest child is felt in Ng's novel, Izzy's angst is a focal point throughout the miniseries, albeit with a few modifications. Izzy's not-your-puppet protest is present in the source material, but it occurs at a dance recital when she was 11. The show instead makes Izzy a violinist, and the forehead incident takes place in the present. The miniseries also omits a plot point where Izzy shoves toothpicks into classroom doors to get even with a teacher. Of course, that act of rebellion seems rather innocent compared to setting your own hair on fire. Oh my god, Annie, are you okay? Are you okay? What's the matter? Oh my god, are you alright? Isabel? Did you do this on purpose? Number 9. The Kitchen Fight Did you think you were just gonna waltz into my house and pretend like nothing ever happened? Whether you're Team Elena or Team Mia, these women have more in common than either wants to admit. Both view themselves as good mothers, although both suffer from a lack of communication with their children. You know what else you have in common with your friend? You're both terrible mothers. I mean, honestly, it's a miracle that Pearl is as lovely and wonderful as she is. For all the parallels, though, there is a major contrast that Mia points out before storming off. Elena was born entitled, and Mia didn't have the same luxuries growing up. You didn't make good choices. You had good choices. Options that being rich and white and entitled gave you. That said, this doesn't automatically excuse some of the choices Mia has made. At the end of the day, both have started their fair share of fires, but neither will take personal responsibility for them. Few scenes in the miniseries better exemplify how different and how similar these two are. Yet, this thought-provoking argument was not present in the book. I thought we were friends. White women always want to be friends with their maid. I was not your maid, Elena, and I was never your friend. Number 8. Lexi plagiarizes Pearl without permission For the most part, Lexi and Pearl's dynamic in the show doesn't differ drastically from what happens in the book. There are a few tweaks, however, that paint Lexi as even more insensitive. For her Yale essay, Lexi needs to write about an obstacle in life that she overcame. Um, you know, your story actually inspired the essay I wrote for Yale. It did? Totally. I mean... Whether you're black, or a girl, or like both, when something like that happens to one of us, it's like it happens to all of us, you know? Due to her privileged upbringing, though, she can't think of anything attention-grabbing. In the source material, the paper is not only on a different topic, but Pearl says that she can write the paper for her. And this is an offer that Lexi is all too happy to accept. By contrast, in the miniseries, Lexi hears about the prejudice that Pearl experienced at school and repurposes it as her own story, switching out racism with sexism. <laughs> Why wouldn't I be cool? I mean, she took your counselor story and wrote it as if it happened to her, so... Wait, you mean the one I inspired? Wow. <laughs> Is that what she told you? Lexi neglects to tell Pearl this up front and later buys her address in order to vindicate this deception. Oh my god, Pearl, you're getting it. I can't, it's way too much. Uh, you can because I'm paying for it. No, Lexi, I can't let you do that. Number 7. The Book Club Conversation As much as they clash, the miniseries does add a new noteworthy scene where Elena and Mia connect. So Personal. what are you talking about then? What are you saying, that my vagina is just worth less than your vagina? You're getting very upset. Yeah, I think Elena's touching on something that speaks to the heart of the piece. Elena's book club gets awkward fast, which is to be expected when the subject is the vagina monologues. Despite not being on the best of terms, Mia comes to Elena's aid and tries putting her contentious comments into perspective. But we as a society have a deep discomfort calling them by name, let alone regarding them with respect or 
actually seeing them. Mia actually mentions a key theme in the miniseries and book, the fear of seeing one's true self. But I think Elena is talking about vaginas as a metaphor for our own discomfort with the parts of us that make us most uniquely and primally who we are. Elena sends her an appreciative glance and Mia smiles back. In this fleeting moment, we're given a glimpse of what might have been. If these two were able to put race, class, and pride aside, a true friendship possibly could have blossomed. Thank you for saving me in there. It isn't long, however, until the barriers go back up. Number six, more backstory for Elena. Both the book and miniseries flesh out Mia's past in great detail. Elena's backstory, on the other hand, was only touched upon in the book, leaving the reader to fill in many of the blanks. Hello? Jamie? Yes, who's this? It's, it's me, it's, it's Elena. The show offers more details on Elena's earlier years, most notably expanding upon her relationship with ex-boyfriend Jamie Reynolds. Instead of being drafted and likely dying in Vietnam, on-screen Jamie goes on to become a successful journalist. Are you happy? Are you? Happy. We see Elena reconnect with Jamie twice in the miniseries, once when she was a struggling young mother, and again years later when she tries to dig up dirt on Mia. You don't have to settle. You do not have to be miserable. The miniseries also reveals that Elena wasn't too happy about having a fourth child, giving new context to animosity between her and Izzy. You're pregnant. No. Yes. Number 5. Elena Tries Bribing Bibi If you want to reclaim custody of your child, Showing up at the adoptive parent's house uninvited while screaming frantically probably isn't the best strategy. It's my baby! Baby in the book could have put this together, but the show's version can't resist crashing the McCullough's birthday party for Mirabelle slash Mei Ling. This leads to another shocking confrontation in the miniseries where Elena visits Bibi's apartment. In exchange for letting the McCulloughs raise the baby without further interference, Elena offers Bibi $10,000 and assistance on the immigration front. We have lawyers who can have papers drawn that will grant Linda and Mark full custody, but they are good and reasonable people, and I'm sure they would grant visitation if you wanted to still see Mirabelle. Bibi is insulted by this proposal, especially since Elena is a mother and wouldn't put a price on her own children. Have children, miss? Yes, I do. I have four children. How much you sell them for? Concerning the baby's welfare, the miniseries has both Bibi and Elena make rash decisions that blow up in their faces. Don't fight them, Bibi. You're gonna lose. You should take the money. It's that or nothing. Number four, Mia and Pauline's relationship. Come to my opening. To my friend's gallery in the East Village. Next weekend. In both incarnations, Pauline Hawthorne acts as Mia's mentor during her youth. The two grow close, and when Pauline abruptly dies, it takes a heavy toll on Mia. But what's wrong? What happened? Pauline passed away. Pauline and Mia's relationship goes one step further in the show, however. In the book, they have a platonic teacher-student bond. We're always losing people, aren't we? Not me. I'm staying. <laughs> At most, you could say that Mia develops a parent-child rapport with Pauline and her partner Mal. In the miniseries, an intimate romance blossoms between Mia and Pauline, with Mal out of the picture. Speaking of pictures, the source material sees Pauline take photos of Mia and newborn Pearl, although the miniseries replaces these with a single photo of Mia with child. My turn. <laughs> Mia's sexuality is also altered from the book, which suggested she was asexual. Number 3. Izzy's Sexuality 
Like Mia, Izzy's sexual orientation was given virtually no exploration in the book. Well, we're gonna be in high school with all of them. Can we just try to fit in a little? In the show, Izzy's romantic relationship with a girl named April directly ties into why she's acting out now more than ever. At a party, April coldly throws Izzy under the bus so she can stay in the closet. Get off me! <laughs> Wait, I thought you guys were friends. Not after she just, like, molested me. As word of Izzy's sexuality starts spreading around the school, she's bullied by her classmates, who put an Ellen DeGeneres picture in her locker. <laughs> Elena would rather turn a blind eye than have an honest conversation with Izzy about her sexuality. You shouldn't let those girls write a story for you. If they're saying something untrue, then you should change the story. This not only gives more depth to Izzy's struggles at home and school, but also adds new dimensions to the surrogate mother bond she feels towards Mia. The deal is I let you help me and you don't ask any questions. Number two, who started the fire? The show's primary mystery revolves around who set the Richardson residence on fire. This isn't much of a guessing game in the book, as it's pretty obvious from the get-go that Izzy burned the house down. What do you think she's saying? She'll probably find a way to blame Izzy. The miniseries plays with our expectations in the finale as Izzy, infuriated that Elena drove Mia and Pearl away, sprinkles gasoline all over her room. In a huge deviation, Izzy is stopped by her siblings and mother. God, oh my God, what are, Stop! Stop! Wait, what are you doing? After Izzy runs off, her sister and brothers come to the conclusion that maybe she had the right idea, setting the cage their mother built them ablaze. Maybe Izzy's the only one who actually had it right. The kids do get their mother out of the house, and realizing the error of her ways, Elena says that she started these little fires. I did it. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, Mia and Pearl's race. The point is to rent to someone who can um, enjoy it. For all its changes, the Hulu series is mostly faithful to Ng's book. The show incorporates one element in particular, though, that presents the story in a new light. It, it was actually one of the first schools integrated in the city. I know that because my mother was on the board there when it happened. The novel neglects to mention Mia and Pearl's race, although it's strongly implied that they're white. In the miniseries, they're both played by black actresses, making racial prejudice a key talking point. So when Elena asks Mia to be her house manager, it suddenly takes on an even more uncomfortable sentiment. I've been meaning to hire someone for my house. Um, just to do a little light cleaning, some laundry, maybe cook dinner. You mean, like to be your maid? This addition blends in naturally with the source material's central theme of classism. Little Fires Everywhere is about looking past a seemingly picture-perfect surface to see the problems underneath. Well, with all this affirmative action stuff, you'll be a shoe in practically anywhere. Ow, what? That's what Brian always says. That's her boyfriend. He's African-American. Revisiting the 90s, it becomes clear that these weren't such innocent times as some assumed. You know you're not like the Richardsons, right? I know that. The cops are not on our side. It wasn't even a cop. We don't get passes like them. The last thing we need is to be on somebody's radar. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.